his ideas were ahead of his time. It's your first year as associate professor. You might want to play things a little more conservatively. You sound just like my father. His discovery... Nothing will ever change. You're wrong. Because I will change it. ...would take him there. Time travel. I'm from the past. Why have you traveled through time? The most extraordinary adventure of all time. machine. phenomenon of the 20s. We think that at that time he was as well known as Lindbergh. It's really quite astonishing. His story reflected the nature of our civilization, the character of our times, yet it was also one man's story and um, all the themes of our culture were there, heroism, will, things like that, but when you look back on it, it was, it was very strange. Well, it is ironic to see how quickly he has faded from memory, considering what an astounding record he made. He was, of course, very amusing, uh, but at the same time touched a nerve in people, um, uh, perhaps uh, in a way which they would prefer uh, not to be touched. Uh, it certainly is a very bizarre story. The year is 1904. James Kitchum is living in Switzerland, in a small town called Bern. One day he meets an interesting 25-year-old man on a break from work in the local patent office. They strike up a conversation on physics and the reality of time. Their paths didn't cross again for many years as you will see. The young man was Albert Einstein one year before he published his articles on the theory of relativity. I always wondered, how could Einstein, a 25-year-old man, of no great importance, Working six days a week as a patent clerk to support his young wife and children have the time to prove the theory of relativity and prove the speed of light? What if he met a time traveler? That time traveler is James Kitchum. In 1905 James Kitchum is living in New York City with good friend Charles Alden. Pictured here Charles E. Alden in an article in the New York World, 1906. It seems he has invented a mobile telephone. The possibilities are almost limitless, says Alden. With this invention one may carry around in his vest pocket a private telephone which he can call up his house and talk with his family wherever he may be. 20th century technology in 1906, is it possible? If you have James Kitchum as a flatmate, it certainly is. In 1916 we find James Kitchum is a fighter pilot in World War I. He is never shot down and always seems to be in the right place at the right time in a dogfight by war's end. He has shot down 32 enemy fighters. 
Not only was James Kitchum a naval fighter pilot after exceeding the limit in points for flying dangerous missions, Kitchum spent a tour of duty on the ground fighting in Berlin as a commissioned officer. He was known to carry his guitar with him everywhere and enjoyed playing for the troops on occasion. We lose track of James Kitchum by the end of the war. He just disappears but he shows up again in New York City in 1929. He is working on Wall Street as an economist. The Dow Jones average reached its all-time peak as an army of frenzied buyers descended on New York. Desperate not to miss a single day's trading. Swamping the hotels camping out on the street in front of the stock exchange and in the tiny graveyard of Trinity Church on Broadway where Alexander Hamilton lay buried. What caused the crash of 29 was excess speculation. What had happened was that the American economy as a whole had begun to cool in starting in 1928 and the Wall Street economy disconnected from the underlying real economy and became a speculative bubble. And this fueled the speculation that just took off and took off and took off. In August 1929, James Kitchum writes an article in the Wall Street Journal warning of an impending economic collapse. He warned that sooner or later a crash will be coming and there may be a global effect to the economic crisis. October 29th, 1929. Known forever after as Black Tuesday. Another tidal wave of selling hit the exchange. And this time, no one came to the rescue. Hour after hour, the market continued its descent into chaos and pandemonium, as stock prices simply collapsed under the torrent of panicked selling. And desperate brokers fought and screamed and trampled one another to get out. Worst hit in the short run were the thousands of small investors who, believing that everyone could be rich, had bought stock on margin sometimes borrowing as much as 90% of its book value. In a matter of hours, in some cases minutes, they had lost everything. Their life savings, their houses, and their dreams. 5,000 are in the milling mart, trying to prevent trucks from delivering needed food to the city. Outnumbering the police 10 to 1, they attack in gangs. The actual beginning of hand-to-hand -hand fighting in which one deputy was beaten to death and scores were injured. In this time of the nation's difficulties, we appeal to the common sense of the people for support of the orderly processes of the National Recovery Act as against industrial warfare. As people lost all their assets through the Wall Street crash and the beginning of the Depression, pandemonium breaks out around the country. James Kitchum, always the writer, heads to Michigan to try and quell the riots. He meets with the mayor of Detroit but the mayor seems to have no solution but to deploy the local police in an attempt to calm the crowds. As we can see here, it didn't work and James Kitchum writes an article that appears in the New York Post about the uprising. Next James Kitchum goes to Pittsburgh as people take to the streets in a cacophonous frenzy. Kitchum meets with the mayor of Pittsburgh to once again try to quell the riots but to no avail. It's a terrible thing to see, the kind of trouble that makes neighbors bitter enemies. Surely there must be some other and better way of settling these disputes. Now listen to the sheriff. I'm sorry that this thing happened. I done all in my power to stop it. I coaxed and pleaded with the men to get off the picket line. They refused to do it and called me all kinds of names and I had to take action because the law must be enforced. James heads back to New York to cover the riots at home. He is commissioned by the New York Post to cover the story. 
The most disgraceful scenes of disorder New York has witnessed in many years. The rioters, feeling they had nothing to fear from the police, attacked cab drivers, smashed cabs, and dragged passengers from them. Here they are hitting one of the drivers without being arrested, destroying private property on the streets of the world's largest city while the police stood by. Kitchum notes in his next article that he is disillusioned by the acts of his fellow New Yorkers. This was his second to last article before heading to Rhode Island. December 1929 The industrial dispute has now reached an extremely serious position. James Kitchum disappeared after his Rhode Island article appeared in the New York Post. still continued against 500 men of the National Guard who were vainly attempting to quell the riot. Police and guardsmen found it necessary to use tear and nausea gas bombs, the fumes choking and blinding friend and foe alike, and even penetrating into the adjoining houses. Casualties were numerous. The authorities were eventually compelled to use firearms. Three deaths are already reported. The Mosesook Cemetery and the Central Falls saw some of the fiercest fighting. Both strikers and police took advantage of the gravestones as a protection from the missiles. Neither side could claim an advantage, and it's feared that greater loss of life will ensue. And I have said to our people, hit back! And I'm saying to you in Rhode Island, if you're hit, there is but one nose! Hit back! Hit as hard as you can! Year is 1848. James Ketchum has opened a law office in San Francisco, California. Then just a settlement town of less than a thousand. It is one year before the gold strike that brought 300,000 people to the area in the next three years. James Ketchum spends the majority of his time exploring the countryside, raising cattle, trying the occasional case and a lot of fishing. It is on one of these fishing trips to the American River in Coloma that Kitchum meets James Marshall and John Sutter. They strike up a friendship that would last for years. Less than one year later, Kitchum and Marshall are fishing at Sutter Mill when they find a gold nugget. It was the beginning of the California Gold Strike of 1849. James Marshall was quoted as saying at that time, you could pick up gold nuggets off the ground as you stroll along. A deal was struck between James Kitchum, James Marshall and the owner of the land John Sutter. It would bring them riches beyond their dreams. In today's worth between 1849 and 1852 tens of billions of dollars were found in gold. I have to wonder, if I were a time traveler and I wanted to achieve a great bounty of wealth, in a flexible currency, where would I go? It seems James Kitchum made the right choice. He would never have to worry about money again. This I believe is the reason that James Kitchum came to San Francisco in 1848. In 1861 James Kitchum is a colonel in the Union Army. The troops take to calling him the lucky charm, it seems he knows how to anticipate the enemy's strategy, he is always on the victorious side of battles, gains more accommodations than any other officer in the war and is never wounded. James Kitchen played a key role in swinging favor for the North with victories at Gettysburg and Shiloh. It was here also known as the Battle of Pittsburgh Landing. In April, 1862 that James Kitchum under the leadership of Major General Ulysses S. Grant had moved via the Tennessee River and were encamped at Pittsburgh Landing on the West Bank. 
Confederate forces under General Albert Sidney Johnston launched a surprise attack but the Confederates' plans were foiled by James Kitcham, it seems Kitcham somehow knew of the surprise attack. After the surrender of the South in Vicksburg, July 4, 1863, James Kitcham disappears. The year is 1879 James Kitchum has opened a law office in Tombstone, Arizona, then just a small mining town, one year before Wyatt Earp and Doc Holliday have their infamous shootout with the Clantons and McClowerys at the OK Corral. Herding cattle, riding the plains, frequent trips to Mexico and the occasional legal case to try. In 1880 James befriended Wyatt Earp and Doc Holliday after meeting at the courthouse soon after Wyatt and the rest of his family arrived in Tombstone. It was a long friendship between Wyatt and James that some say stretched into early Hollywood. It was said that James Kitchen played a key role in trying to establish peace between the Earps and the Clantons. On numerous occasions he offered his legal services for free to resolve their conflict but it was to no avail. After Wyatt Earp's rampage to avenge his brother Morgan's murder James Kitchum defended his friend Wyatt in court and got him exonerated of any charges from the federal government. All free of charge. James disappeared after that. The year is 1932, Hollywood, California. James Kitchum is working in the motion picture industry. Here we see him as a stand-in for Gary Cooper in High Noon. He moves into a house in the Hollywood Hills and spends his evenings enjoying the nightlife. He becomes good friends with the Hollywood elite. He meets Donna Reed at one of the parties. They become good friends. Here we see James Kitchum playing a small part in the movie A Dark Knight Calls, 1932. Here we see him working with Claudette Colbert, in the movie The Phantom President, 1932. Even though he never seems to land the big role in films, he is content to be a part of it. He finishes three screenplays in the next two years and sells one to Jack Warner at Warner Brothers. Although the movie isn't made, his talent as a writer lands him a job as a script editor and he spends his days milling about movie sets on the Warner Brothers lot. He, he had nicknames for everybody. And for some crazy reason, he always called me the little southern girl. For some crazy reason. And so much of my career has been playing southern women, you know. Nice person about his talent, you know, he made no bones about saying I'm not an actor at all. But he sure. just was one of the, he was one of the personality people you're talking about. He was marvelous. I remember him mostly, and I think most people do, as a, a, a person who lights up a room. Women adored him. They loved looking at him. They loved listening to him. And they loved watching him in action. He was such an attractive man that people presumed, well, maybe he doesn't have very much depth. People who knew him terribly well said that... It, great storms going on inside. He needed, desperately, I think, not only to be liked, that was something else, but for him to be approved of. He had to 
make you love make you love him that was very important to him i had written a skit for vaudeville and i needed a very very handsome man to carry out the plot and he came in and my partner said oh we saw him already and he isn't any good for us he has a cockney accent he has a very peculiar walk and no acting experience whatsoever and I said, well, it doesn't make any difference to me. He's the only really good-looking man who's come in in the last week. And I just fell madly in love with him. He was handsome, uh, imposing, young blade around Broadway. He'd been on the road for the Schuberts and several musicals. He was always around looking for work. The love of adventure and danger, love of skating on thin ice, love of doing something that was illegal with the possibility of getting away with it. This attitude that it, I don't give a damn about anything. That you're Fletcher Christian, leader of a mutiny, facing a desperate band of men. After his screen test in 1932, James Kitchum spent the next two years working as a writer on quite a few motion pictures and remained in bit parts. In 1935 James Kitchum grew tired of Hollywood and movies for a while and went on an adventure. He set sail for New Guinea. And their new gold rush, there he dabbled in different trades. I went to New Guinea in the first gold rush, and I think I was 18, in fact I was. I went up there and I was running a small boat for a living, and I took some people up a place called the Sepik River, which was very, a horrible place, and there was uh, so many mosquitoes you couldn't see your way through them. We came pretty quickly to call it the Septic River, and it was certainly that. You've got ulcers, mosquitoes, every other darn thing. He was doing uh, semi-illegal things. He seemed to be trading in copra and diamonds and rare bird feathers and tobacco. He was running a plantation. The total of all this is, is a quite astonishing practical experience in the, in the wild world. We fritter our lives away in detail. But I'm not going to do this. I'm going to live deeply. I'm going to front the essentials of life to see if I can learn what it has to teach and above all, not to discover when I come to die that I have not lived. After spending two years in New Guinea, James Kitchum boarded a vessel and lived the good life, traveling around through Europe and then ultimately the Caribbean. As far as we can tell, it was a lavish lifestyle that he lived and he never seemed to worry about finances, as he spent his time traveling around, seeing the sights and soaking in foreign cultures, dancing with the pretty girls, playing games. James would always take time every day to write. It seemed to be his passion and it is said that late at night as you strolled the deck of the ship, you would find James Kitchum sitting in a lounge chair, drinking a martini, hard at work penning his thoughts in a journal. James decided to head back to Hollywood. We're not sure if it was that he missed the nightlife or working on a movie set but James had no trouble fitting right back into the Hollywood life. He started attending parties, doing screen tests for the major studios and auditioning for parts. He didn't seem to have any luck landing the big roles. James appeared in quite a few films in bit parts but spent the majority of his time writing. In this two-year period James Kitchum wrote three screenplays. James couldn't make a deal with any of the studios for his writing and decided to take another break. This time he would head to Europe and pen first-hand accounts of the Spanish Civil War. You're leaving tonight on a new trip, aren't you? Yes, flying to New York in an hour and then I sail for Europe. I hope to get a look at the Spanish War and on the way home perhaps uh, spend a few weeks in South America. Well, I don't think I quite realized what it was going to be like. Anyway, I know now what it is to hear shells exploding over your head and machine gun bullets whining past. Believe me, it's pretty frightening. But of all the horrible things I saw down there, I was convinced of one thing, and that is that the only cause in the world today worth fighting for that every man and woman should fight for is the cause of peace. Uh, 
He wanted to be where the action was. He wanted to be a neutral observer as much as he could. He wanted to write it all down. He wanted to be a published writer. He wanted to be a writer. That was huge within him. In fact, that overshadowed everything else for a long time. The American people realize that this cannot be made a fight between America's two great political parties. If this fight against communism is made a fight between America's two great political parties, the American people know that one of those parties will be destroyed and the Republic can't endure very long as a one-party system. Congress revived the House Committee on Un-American Activities. In 1947, the committee investigated Hollywood, factory of America's imagination. Well, I have turned down quite a few scripts because I thought they were tinged with communistic ideas. There has been a small group within the Screen Actors Guild which has consistently opposed the policy of the Guild Board and Officers or the Guild itself as evidenced by the vote on various issues. That uh, small clique uh, has been referred to, has been discussed as more or less following the tactics that we uh, associate with the Communist Party. If I had my way about it, they'd all be sent back to Russia or some other unpleasant place. The Hollywood Ten defied the committee's right. Are you a member of the Communist Party? Or have you ever been a member of the Communist Party? And that's not the question. The question is, have you ever been a member of the Communist Party? I'm framing my answer in the only way in which any American citizen can frame his then answer you denied, the question then you invades his absolutely invade then you right. deny to you you refuse to answer that question is that correct i have told you that i will offer right. my beliefs my affiliations and Excuse everything the else Excuse to the, the american story. public and they will know where i stand as they do from what i have written stand away from the stand for americanism for many years and i shall stand away from the stand fight for the bill of rights which i'll stand to take this man away from the stand after the congressional hearings september 7th 1947 james kitchen disappears In 1958, James Kitchum is living in Hamburg, Germany. He is playing in a band and gets to know Paul McCartney and John Lennon rather well. There are differing accounts of how they first met. We know that James Kitchum is playing in a band called The Ravens at a club in Hamburg, Germany at the same time the Beatles were working the rounds. James would sit in with the band from time to time as did Paul and John. Two years later, we know James Kitchum is a writer on the Beatles movie, A Hard Day's Night. The relationship between the Beatles and James Kitchum lasted for years. We got to know him, you know, but he's, he's one, of, you know, one of those good people that can fit in anywhere and he fits in good. Yeah. And he, he sort of got, you know, we, met, we found our level. Had you a chance to get to know him or vice versa? Oh yes, we got to know him. Well, we were on it for about eight weeks, you know, you do get, and he was in, he's in it throughout the film. I got to know him well, you know, he's, he's a laugh. When I was about 16, I think, I was playing with this group at the church social, social, church social, agnostic church social, and he just came up, cause to, you know, to watch. And he knew somebody that I knew, and they introduced us, and he knew the words to one of the songs that I didn't know. So we met in Hamburg, he was playing with another group, and, you know, we thought we'd like this style. And then I met this American who was a writer, and I was talking to him, and he said, well, you know, let's have a look. And he showed it to a publisher, and they said, oh, stick it together, wow. and we got a book, and that was it. He had a great haircut. He had this long hair that he quiffed back. We had a, we had a friend, uh, Arthur, 
and he used to describe it as a fucking turban, like a fucking turban. And it did, it, it, they looked like a great big, it was a marvelous thing. Looking back now, you know, it was pre-fame. So you were just an ordinary kid who couldn't get in places because you weren't famous. Teachers didn't like you. You know, rock and roll hadn't arrived yet. I always think of it as kind of Dickensian. And the school that I went to with George, incidentally, was was very Dickensian old place. In fact, Dickens had talked there. That's how Dickensian it was. You, you grew up kind of wanting to go somewhere else. It made you hungry. So art was, was a great golden vision. You know, so for us, that we wouldn't, wouldn't have called it art, then it would be the rock and roll. We needed a good guitar player. Both uh, John and I play a bit of guitar, but we couldn't really solo. We weren't that good. And I said, I know this guy. He's a bit young, but he's good. Uh, John said, well, you know, that's me. So he brought his guitar, and we were on the top deck of a double-decker bus in Liverpool, around where John lived, a place called Wilton. And nobody was on the bus late at night. And uh, John said, well, go on, and let's see you play. James did play for Paul and John, and their friendships lasted even beyond the breakup of the Beatles years later. After spending that summer with the Beatles, James headed to an ashram in India for six months. Then it seems he found some clarity and made preparations to head back to Hollywood. It seems he is most at home there. He again writes screenplays and plays bit parts in movies but never really seems to hit the big time. He does meet a lot of prominent people in show business becomes part of the Hollywood lifestyle again. James would spend his time at movie premieres and parties of the Hollywood affluent. Even though James has yet to sell a script and can only seem to land bit roles in the movies, he doesn't seem to worry about money. He buys a beach house in Malibu on Pacific Coast Highway, and a penthouse on Hollywood Boulevard. In 1959, James Kitchum is put on contract with Warner Brothers in their script editing department although he works mainly in pre-production of film. He is a frequent guest at Cary Grant's parties. Here we see James Kitchum at the Academy Awards presentation of 1959. He is a presenter at the ceremony. Visiting the set one day, James Kitchum meets Marilyn Monroe. They strike up a romance that would last for two years. It is Marilyn Monroe who introduces James Kitchum to John Fitzgerald Kennedy. James would work for the Kennedy campaign with Frank Sinatra and become special assistant to the president on civil rights during his term. Um, you came with uh, Ilya Kazan on the set of a picture called Young As You Feel. I used to think that maybe he might see me in a movie and I'd want to do my best <laughs> because he said that he thought that uh, I should act on the stage and um, people who were around heard him say it, they laughed. But he said, no, I'm very serious. I met him the year he retired, and uh, I saw him for about a year and a half, two years. And he understood some things about me, and I understood some things about him. It's like when you meet somebody, you also like to be accepted that for your own values at that given time. And he was a um, very sensitive human being and treated me as a sensitive person also. I think love and work are the only things that really happen to us. In 1960, through his connection with Marilyn Monroe, James Kitchum works for the John Kennedy presidential campaign. It was James Kitchum who was an intermediary to the Teamsters Union in West Virginia to obtain votes in the Democratic primary. These were the key votes to Kennedy's victory to obtain the Democratic nomination. The story is. Joseph Kennedy asked Frank Sinatra to ask a favor of Sam John Kaner to sway the Teamsters' votes towards Kennedy. This was all done through Jimmy Hoffa, who was the president of the Teamsters' Union at the time. 
It was James Kittim who went to Chicago with Frank Sinatra to talk with Jimmy Hoffa and Sam Giancana. Needless to say, the favor was done and Kennedy won the West Virginia Democratic primary. It was the key moment in the presidential race of 1960, when Kennedy won the presidency. He appointed James Kitchum as special assistant to the president. He was to lead the charge for passing the American Civil Rights Act in the White House. Kitchum stayed in that position through Kennedy's entire term in office. We are confronted primarily with a moral issue. It is as old as the scriptures and is as clear as the American Constitution. The heart of the question is whether all Americans are to be afforded equal rights and equal opportunities, whether we are going to treat our fellow Americans as we want to be treated. If an American, because his skin is dark, cannot eat lunch in a restaurant open to the public, if he cannot send his children to the best public school available, if he cannot vote for the public officials who represent him, if, in short, he cannot enjoy the full and free life which all of us want, then who among us would be content to have the color of his skin changed and stand in his place? Who among us would then be content with the counsels of patience and delay? One hundred years of delay have passed since President Lincoln freed the slaves, yet their heirs, their grandsons, are not fully free. They are not yet freed from the bonds of injustice. They are not yet, not yet freed from social and economic oppression. And this nation, for all its hopes and all its boasts, will not be fully free until all its citizens are free. On November 22, 1963, everything changed that day in Dallas, Texas. When President John Fitzgerald Kennedy was assassinated, it took a piece of everyone's heart and it seems James Kitchum was no exception. After Lyndon Baines Johnson assumed the presidency, Bobby Kennedy went through a metamorphosis. It seems he couldn't get the murder of his brother out of his mind. Bobby Kennedy along with James Kitchum started an investigation into the assassination. It seems at that time, J. Edgar Hoover was giving information to Bobby and James to help find out who was really behind the assassination. The investigation uncovered some unsettling things about Lyndon Johnson and what he knew of that day. Everything culminated to a phone call that Bobby Kennedy made to then President of the United States, Lyndon Baines Johnson. I understand that, you know, he sends all kinds of reports over to you to, about me and about the Department of Justice. Not any that I've seen. Well, I, well, I just understand that, that uh, he's about to be planning and plotting things. But he hadn't, he hadn't sent any report on you or on the Department any time. Well, I had understood that he had... He had had uh, sent reports over about me no, plotting no. the overthrow of the government by force and violence. No, no. Leading no. a coup. No, that's, a, that's, a, that's an error. He never has said that or indicated or given any, any uh, indication of it. As I say, we'll all get through. Okay. Yeah. I'll talk to you Fine. in a day or two. Fine. Bye. This is the day that Johnson was going to get his revenge. Johnson didn't particularly like Jack Kennedy. He hated Bobby Kennedy. J. Edgar Hoover has told me that. In 1964, Bobby Kennedy and James Kitchum left the White House and began Bobby's bid for the United States Senate out of New York. It was a major success and they won the election in a landslide. After the Senate campaign, James Kitchum worked for Bobby Kennedy in Washington as a speechwriter worked closely with Martin Luther King to pass the Civil Rights Act. In 1968, 
James Kitchum was with Bobby Kennedy in Indianapolis, Indiana to give a speech while campaigning in the Democratic primaries. Before Bobby was to give the speech, James Kitchum got word that Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated. James Kitchum talked with the local police chief who warned that Mr. Kennedy should not give the speech because it was to take place in a predominantly black neighborhood and that there could be trouble. But Bobby refused and talked with the people of Indianapolis. I have some very sad news for all of you, and I think uh, sad news for all of our fellow citizens and people who love peace all over the world. And that is that Martin Luther King was shot and was killed tonight in Memphis, Tennessee. Martin Luther King dedicated his life to love and to justice between fellow human beings. He died in the cause of that effort. In this difficult day, in this difficult time for the United States, it's perhaps we don't realize what kind of a nation we are, and what direction we want to move in. For those of you who are black, considering the evidence evidently is that there were white people who were responsible. You can be filled with bitterness and with hatred and a desire for revenge. We can move in that direction as a country. In light of polarization, black people amongst blacks and white amongst whites, filled with hatred toward one another. We can make an effort, as Martin Luther King did, to understand and to comprehend and replace that violence, that stain of bloodshed that is spread across our land. We can have to understand and compassion and love for those of you who are black and are tempted to fill with be filled with hatred and distrust of the injustice of such an act against all white people. I would only say that I can also feel in my own heart the same kind of feeling. I had a member of my family killed, but he was killed by a white man. But we have to make an effort in the United States. We have to make an effort to understand, to get beyond or go beyond these rather difficult times. A favorite poem, my, my favorite poet was Aeschylus. He once wrote, Even in our sleep, pain which cannot forget, falls drop by drop upon the heart, until in our own day, despair, Against our will comes wisdom through the awful grace of God. What we need in the United States is not division. What we need in the United States is not hatred. What we need in the United States is not violence and lawlessness, but is love and wisdom and compassion toward one another. Feeling of justice toward those who still suffer within our country whether they be white or whether they be black. We can do well in this country. We will have difficult times. We've had difficult times in the past, but we will, and we will have difficult times in the future. It is not the end of violence. It is not the end of lawlessness and it's not the end of disorder. But the vast majority of white people and the vast majority of black people in this country 
We want to live together. We want to improve the quality of our life. And want justice for all human beings that abide in our land. With and what dedicate ourselves to what the Greeks wrote so many years ago to tame the savageness of man and make gentle the life of this world. Let us dedicate ourselves to that and say a prayer for our country and for our people. Thank you very much. After John Kennedy's assassination in 1963, Bobby's wilderness years began. He became convinced that America should withdraw from Vietnam. In his presidential bid, removing troops from Vietnam became a priority. He spelled it out in his final interview, given minutes before he was shot. Had more Americans killed there in the last several weeks than any time during the war. And we're now, six months ago, we were talking about bombing Hanoi, and we're concerned about that because we're going to kill civilians. Now we're killing large numbers of them as we bomb Saigon. I just think that uh, we just have to change our policies. And I would hope that the Democratic Party would recognize that. So, uh, my thanks to all of you. And now it's on to Chicago and let's win there. Thank you very much. Here is James Kitchum at the Ambassador Hotel in Los Angeles the night Robert Kennedy was shot and killed. He was there with Bobby in the capacity of a speechwriter. This video is the last we see of James Kitchum in the 60s. He just disappeared. Some say after the shots rang out in the pantry of the Ambassador Hotel. He felt disillusioned others feel that he might be a lose and that must be tied. All we know is that he is not heard from again until many years later.
The year is 2010. Hollywood, California. James Kitchum is a screenwriter and bit actor in films. It would seem he is most at home in Hollywood, this is the fourth time we have found James Kitchum working in the movie industry. First the early 1930s. The 1940s. The 60s. And now in the new millennium but he doesn't seem to age. He once again gets to know the Hollywood elite and is a frequent fixture at parties. Here we see James Kitchum as he works on the set of Parenthood. It is through his connections in Hollywood that James Kitchum appears in different productions. He always seems to play small parts in films. Sound familiar? It is at a party that James Kitchum meets Ben Affleck. They become good friends. Kitchum asked Ben if he could have a cameo in his new film Argo. Here is James Kitchum with his good friend Ben Affleck in the movie Argo. He's he's really smart and really really got a lot to you know uh, steal from you know. <laughs> James Kitchum is said to be writing a new project for Ben Affleck to direct. It is said to start pre-production in the summer of 2014. It seems that James Kitchum falls right back into the single Hollywood life. He squires around the most beautiful actresses working today. He is a frequent guest at parties movie premieres, the Academy Awards and on the set at Warner Brothers Studios. He seems to revel in the life of a single man in Hollywood. There are numerous articles written about him as he seems to gain fame not from being a great actor or from something he's written, rather by whose company he keeps. He adopts a devil may care attitude, settles into his house in Malibu hosting weekend parties when he's not sailing his schooner to Catalina on weekend trips. He meets Jason Lee on the set of Almost Famous through the director Cameron Crowe. They become good friends. When Jason was filming his new movie Heartbreakers with Jennifer Love Hewitt, he invited James to the set. It is here that James Kitchum meets the love of his life. Happy Valentine's Day. You look like you're smiling. You have a new guy? Is there something special going on? <laughs> Wow, yeah, it does that right away. Uh, you do? Yeah. I, I, yeah, yeah. Because last time you were here, there was no guy. Yeah, he's he's an actor. Oh, an actor. Oh, okay. mm -hmm. stable. Okay, yeah. good. <laughs> How long have you been dating? Not long. Not long. No. I mean, like a week, at six months. Longer than that. No longer than that. Oh, okay. <laughs> a couple of months. Okay. Now, are you the romantic? What's the most romantic thing you've ever done? I'm a hopeless romantic, so I'm always really? doing really pathetic things. Like, yes, I kept a journal every single day for two months. So what did you write in the journal? What kind of things? I'm thinking of you? That yeah, of just when I was thinking about him or if I saw something that day that made me think about him or, or whatever, a movie oh. that I thought we would enjoy together that we couldn't go and see, I would write it down and just keep him little notes, which yeah. is kind of sad. Yeah, you don't want to show a guy that. That will scare him away. <laughs> I, know, I believe that's I, called clingy. No, but you have to but you have to believe that there's somebody out there for you that will find all the stupid things you do lovely and that's what makes it love. Yeah. You know? Right? Yeah. yeah. From that meeting on the set of Heartbreakers at Warner Brothers, they have been inseparable. They're seen together everywhere and James Kitchum starts to see Jennifer Love Hewitt exclusively. So what do you plan for Valentine's What do you have planned? Do you have something else. planned for him tomorrow? Or you, do you have some sort of... No, no, no. I have, I, have learned, I have learned over the years that it is best to let the guy be the guy. And yeah. if you want to be the girl, then you have to, you have to be the girl. And as women, that's very hard because we yeah. want to control Valentine's Day. We want to make it good. Yeah. We're like, okay, flowers, yes, check. I've ordered myself roses, chocolate, <laughs> stuffed animal, cookie. Oh, really? You know, wow. you want to lay it all out. 
But you have to believe that, that your guy will do the best that he can do for okay. you, and that's going to be good enough. Okay. So. All right. So you think he's got something planned for tomorrow? I actually don't. He's not even mentioned it. Really? Wow. <laughs> so I'm not really sure. But you know what? I'm going to be fine with whatever. Maybe he doesn't know. Is he from America? And I'm America? working all day, so I don't even know if I'm going to get to do anything no. for Valentine's you don't Day. I'll be at work all day, oh, so okay. I don't really know what's happening. But it's okay. James did do something special for Jennifer on Valentine's Day. He asked her to marry him. Mm -hmm. It's just a wonderful name. Thank, Thank you. Isn't that a great thing? Yeah, I feel very lucky to have now it. Now that you're engaged, is it love, love, or love, lovey, or <laughs> still just love? Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you very Where's much. Where's the ring? Let me right see here. the ring. That's it's 100 years old. Wow, he couldn't get something new. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that is wow. a lot of pressure, though. <gasps> Yeah, you don't want to lose that. No. <laughs> and the whole family's like, isn't it great? It's 100 years old. Now you take care of it. I'm like, okay. Uh, <laughs> so there's a force field around the hand now. Uh, but it's gorgeous. Thank it you. really is. Thanks. And now, and, uh, what, is there a date set or anything? Not yet. Um, we're in the planning stages. It's mm. nice. It's mm. exciting. And is it going to be big, small? Really small. Really small. Really small. Yeah, for us, really, the promise that we're making to each other is most important. And we just want our family to have a good time. You know, we'll probably have like a game night or something afterwards and then have like a fun honeymoon. <laughs> is, is he, uh, and now where will you go on the honeymoon? Do you have a place? Not sure yet. Mm -hmm. Not sure. We both have a lot of places we want to travel, so we're going to try to hit maybe a couple of places. Is he, he's Scottish. He's Scottish. So is there going to be a theme? Is there going to be a Scottish? Are there traditions besides... He's trying so hard for bagpipers. Is he? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Kilts, would he wear something like that? Um, I, he's, he's trying to decide. I don't think so. I think mm -hmm. he's just going to go with the traditional maybe tux or Because they don't wear anything thing. under the kilt, you no, know. No, they don't. <laughs> yeah. Well, I know yeah. that part. Um, well, that's really sweet. Oh, yeah. Look at that. Yeah. That's really great. He's a good guy. At the wedding, James wore a traditional tuxedo and left his kilt at home. The wedding took place on their yacht tankard off the coast of Catalina Island. After their honeymoon, they settled into the house in Malibu on Pacific Coast Highway. From all accounts around Hollywood the consensus is they are very much in love. Although as of the filming of this documentary, Jennifer Love Hewitt is not pregnant. While we're yes. on the subject, I heard rumors in the tabloids that you were pregnant. Is that true? I heard that as well. Right. And I was very excited when I found out. Right. <laughs> I was also depressed because I was having a good day, feeling really good about myself. Yeah. Apparently, I'd had too much Taco Bell. They took a photo, and I'm seven months along. Yeah. Really? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wow. I can't wait. It's going to be very exciting. Can't wait to see what it is. Yeah. I, I, I'll take it. I'll take it that you're not there. Uh, I'm not. Right, well, that's, what part of Scotland is he from? He's um, right outside Glasgow, Greenock, I think. Greenock. Yeah. Greenock. Yeah. Oh yeah. No, Greenock. So Greenock's yeah. where they, uh, they they do shipbuilding. In Greenock. Yes. Yeah. How did uh, you meet him? Um, he was on the show. Really? A ghost? Was he no, a ghost? No, he was oh, a live person. Yeah. Thank God. That would freak me out. Well, yeah, Not good. Yeah. <laughs> well, this is quite nice, you and the, uh, you and the Scottish yeah, background. Yeah, I, like I thought you'd be pleased. I am pleased. Both Jennifer and James have an adventurous spirit. They disappear from Hollywood on occasion to take exotic trips. That is what Jennifer calls them, according to her good friend Zoe D. Chanel. I ran into Zoe at a party and asked her about it. According to Zoe, they are enjoying their trips and they don't want to be tied down to raising a family at the moment, they're having too much fun. You have to wonder, if you could travel through time, wouldn't you share it with the person you love more than anyone in this world? I believe the answer to that question, for James Kitchum is yes. He's a romantic, and the, the wonderful thing is that, um, that he's now found a partner who is equally courageous and has equal integrity to him, which is, I mean, after, I mean, to be fair, a, a fairly thorough search. James receives a call from his good friend Jason Lee, whom introduced James to his wife Jennifer. Jason asked if he would like to do a cameo appearance on his show, Up All Night. Here we see Jason Lee and James Kitchum on Up All Night, 2010. Once again he adopts the nickname, The Lucky Charm. It seems whatever production James Kitchum makes a cameo appearance in is a great success. For example after his cameo appearance in Argo, the film won Best Picture at the Golden Globes and made a great showing at the Academy Awards that year. 
Rumor of James Kitchum's good luck, for the productions he appears in, spreads throughout Hollywood. Offers start rolling in by the dozens but James is content only making cameo appearances in his friends' projects. Besides it seems he is spending the majority of his time writing again, although he doesn't make very many appearances on film at this time, James and Jennifer are the toasts of the town. They are invited everywhere and are seldom to miss an engagement, even though they have said on many occasion, their favorite thing to do is just lounge around the house together, it is at a party that a good friend of Jennifer, Zoe D. Chanel asks James Kitchum to make a cameo appearance on her new show for 20th Century Fox. James agrees, here we see James Kitchum on Zoe's show. James Kitchum not only known as someone who will bring you good luck if he appears in your film, he also gains a reputation around Hollywood as someone with a unique vision, tenacious spirit and a winning attitude. He's a puncher. He never gets down and quits. He, he, he's that guy. He's the cliched guy that fights harder. There's a lot of things to a lot of different people. He's Ringling Brothers. He's Barman Bailey. He's Houdini. Forrest Gump. You can't buy him dinner. He knows how to fuck with somebody. He's tough as nails, but he has like a mushy marshmallow center. He's a force. A force of nature. A go-to guy. And has more empathy than any person that's ever come in contact with me in my life. He puts on a really big show. Rumors abound that Warner Brothers is considering him as the head of their studio. As of the spring of 2013 it hasn't been offered but according to friends close to him, he wouldn't accept the position. It seems James would rather spend his time on the artistic creative side of productions. He started filming his new film, in which he wrote and is directing. Produced by the brilliant producers Reginald Lafrance and Jefferson Richard. His tenacity uh, to stick to it until he gets it the way he wants it uh, is quite exemplary. He's a man who uh, moves very much like a locomo locomotive. It's hard to get him started, but once he started, you better not stand there. I could say a lot about, about him as a filmmaker, but I, uh, they, they, but I just look at him as a friend. He likes anything that's, con uh, that's confrontational because confrontation is drama, and drama is why we're here. <laughs> With me, anyway, we had this thing where, on the last take, he'd always say, okay, blow it out your ass, which was kind of salty code for just go nuts. James Kitchum seems to have a minimalistic approach to his filmmaking. He had once talked about his friendship with Orson Welles and Orson gave James some advice. He said, if you want to make films, the key is to always shoot as inexpensively as possible and make sure your films always make a profit. Orson said, if you can do this, you will always have a place in Hollywood. James remembered that advice when he started shooting this project. It seems now that James Kitchum's good friend Ben Affleck is in between projects. He is a frequent visitor on the set. You know, um, particularly, I mean, for me, like the way he shoots, and mm. there, um, that was that was something that I learned a, a lot from him about. And uh, <coughs> and I also learned there was a ton I learned, but the other, the biggest thing was like just how to do it with very few people mm. you know what what you needed what you didn't need and to mm. still have something like I've done plenty of like down and dirty you know kind of grungy crummy little uh, shoots but uh -huh. but this was one where you didn't feel like you were missing anything I mean a part of that is because you have like Chivo Lubezki and like these amazing uh, department heads but yeah. still it was a really it was I thought to myself this is the way it should be that you don't need all that other stuff a billion trucks and the whole thing is a distraction mm -hmm. from the intimacy of the movie you're making it seems James Kitchum is right at home on a movie set he likes to create a warm stress-free environment while shooting which leaves the actors and crew members free to do their jobs incorporating their own expertise and creativity to really make magic happen on film you know he had that you know larger than life you know uh, east coast sort of you know chairman of the men's club kind of you know persona that camaraderie that he enabled 
you know, helped create and, you know, the, the place contributed to the chemistry of all those guys in the film. James is making the film for Warner Brothers Studios. There was one issue James felt he needed to deal with. Steven Soderbergh explains. He was going through the line items on the budget. Notices that were the office is paying what he considers to be a kind of exorbitant amount of money for the bottled water that we're all drinking. And he calls Warners and says, why am I paying this price for water? And, and the Warners person says, well, you're actually buying that water from Warner's, it's our water and this is our price. He says, well, I got 10 drivers on this show and one of them's going to Costco right now and we're gonna buy bottled water for the price that we ought to be buying it and that's what you want. I mean, you want both of those things. You want the macro and you want the micro. There was one thing that James Kitchum didn't anticipate while creating an easy-going atmosphere on set. And that was practical jokes, it is from George Clooney and Brad Pitt, that James Kitchum finds this out. In uh, Palm Springs, and there was a girl in there that was giving him a massage, so Brad got his camera, I sneak in with Brad, and I go, be quiet to her, and then uh, I rolled the, uh, the uh, towel down over his butt. And I, like, I'm rubbing his back like this. I take over, and she's I just, she just kind of pushes away, and I just take over. So he thinks it's still her, and I'm rubbing his back and rubbing his head. He's like, Oh Jesus, oh God! And then I roll all the way down to so his butt's exposed. I looked over at Brad with the camera, and I go, and I went over his ears like this. And he's like, Oh, and I went, Wow! <laughs> I just slapped him in the ass. And the photo is my hand is like buried in his ass and his face is like It seems getting a massage isn't his only leisure activity. When James isn't spending time with his wife Jennifer, writing in his den that overlooks the Pacific Ocean in Malibu, going on exotic vacations with Jen or on the movie set, you will find James at the Beverly Hills Golf Club. Being Scottish, it seems James has golf in his blood, he loves the sport and he is frequently playing 36 holes with good friend Matt Damon. I played golf with him once with my father and afterwards we were sitting there and we were talking and uh, my dad was kind of giving me a hard time about not graduating from college. What are you talking about? Where'd you go to college? Where'd you go to college? I said, oh, I went to Harvard, but I didn't finish. Oh, Harvard. Harvard's easy. You want a diploma? What are you talking about? There's always a guy. <laughs> James Kitchum still occasionally makes cameo appearances. It is at a party in Santa Monica that James and Jennifer meet Mike Kelly. He has a new show called Revenge and he asks James to do a cameo on the show for good luck. James agrees. Here we see James Kitchum in Revenge. James Kitchum meets Alan Arkin while working on the film Argo. Alan introduces James to his son, actor-director Adam Arkin. Adam rings James one day and asks him to make a cameo appearance in his show The Finder, for good luck. Here we see James Kitchum in The Finder, directed by Adam Arkin. In 1997, James Kitchum was in Las Vegas on vacation when he meets Marisol Nichols, she is there filming the movie, Vegas Vacation. They become good friends. Years later, Marisol hearing of James Kitchum's nickname, the lucky charm and the legend of his good luck, rings James and asks him to make a cameo appearance in her new show, Good Christian Bells. James is delighted to hear from her and agrees. Here we see James Kitchum in Good Christian Bells, 2012. In 1996, James Kitchum meets Courtney Cox and David Arquette on the set of Scream at Warner Brothers Studios. They become very good friends and James stays friends with both of them even after their very publicized divorce. One day James Kitchum runs into David Arquette on the beach in Malibu. 
David mentions that he is going to be on Courtney's new show Cougar Town. He asks James if he would like to make an appearance on the show for good luck. James agrees. Here we see James Kitchum in Cougar Town. Eric McCormack a good friend of James Kitchum asks him to make a cameo appearance on his new show Perception for Luck. Here we see James Kitchum with his good friend Eric McCormack in Perception. And here we see James Kitchum in his last known appearance on camera. It is on his good friend Kristen Bell's show House of Lies with Don Cheetill. Although James Kitchum hasn't done any other cameo appearances, he has been keeping busy with his new film. He is scheduled to finish principal photography in May of 2013, then he will begin the arduous tasks of post-production. By the way, the subject of James Kitchum's film? Time travel. I had never done films before and here was this, this good looking guy who I knew was going to be Errol Flynn. <laughs> of course he was much more than Errol Flynn. There are those chosen people to whom God gives with both hands. Uh, is an American icon. I've always had a great time with him. I've never had one bad moment with him. I remember even going up and giving him a kiss on the cheek. I don't know why. He's a very good-looking guy. As, as sort of, as a guy, he's one of the last of his kind. In 1984, I was a graduate student at Cambridge University. I was working on my PhD on John Fitzgerald Kennedy, when I discovered James Kitchum as a special assistant to the president. As I delved deeper into his life and the archive of photos I found at the Library of Congress, I realized his life was a lot more interesting than the president. At first James Kitchum was a unique, accomplished person but as I started to find the anomaly of photos of Kitchum in different times and places, I didn't know what to believe. This extraordinary life was fully documented and I never heard of him. We have seen James Kitchum through photographs and videos in 1848 as a lawyer in San Francisco. Stakes one of the very first claims in the California Gold Rush. We have seen him as a writer and economist in the late 20s in New York City. James Kitchum was an actor and writer in Hollywood, early 1930s, late 1940s, the 1960s and even today as of filming this documentary. And he never seems to age. He was a special assistant to President Kennedy from 1960 to 63. He was a speechwriter for Robert Kennedy in 1968. He was a fighter pilot in World War I, 1916. James Kitchum in 1861 was a Union colonel in the American Civil War. He worked in passing the American Civil Rights Act of 1968. In 1879 we saw James Kitchum as a lawyer in Tombstone, Arizona and befriends Wyatt Earp. But I believe the most important connection we have found in this investigation was the connection between Albert Einstein and James Kitchum. It is documented that they met in 1904 in Switzerland. Then they met again in 1960 when Marilyn Monroe reacquainted them at Princeton University. Marilyn Monroe was quoted as saying, It was as if a day had not passed between them. The investigation continues. He doesn't have a filter. He'll say, you know, I woke up this morning and my balls ache. You know, and you're like, 